Yeah, thank you all for coming out. Um, so you know what I'm uh, talking about. And the idea is that I talk a little bit about my research, but make it in a way that it's um, accessible to everyone. I hope uh, that I will su su succeed today. So that's my topic. So um, what are we talking about here? Um, so the question is, does it work? Yes. Uh, the question is here, um, if I talk to Siri, does it um, understand what I say? In, in one sense, yes, obviously so. If I ask Siri for a phone number or a restaurant address, right, it usually provides me the correct information. So in this sense, certainly Siri understands what I'm saying. On the other hand, is it more than just an advanced like phone book or more than just the yellow pages? And instead of me thumping through the book, uh, Siri does it for me. And I mean, I've never encountered the idea that uh, a phone book is something like that understands meaning and maybe then Siri doesn't understand meaning as well because it's just as dumb as a phone book. So, and of course, uh, Siri is more than just a dumb phone book. I mean, it recognizes speech, and as we know, speech recognition is a really non-trivial matter, right? But then I have at least this hunch that if we ask these questions, we are not really asking, does Siri accurately process speech? Does it can speech recognition? Uh, does it can look up uh, records? Does it can provide information? But I believe there's an undertow to this question that says, does it really un understand, right? Does it really un un understand? So what does it mean to really understand? Um, in a college setting, we usually have a distinction between like passive, active, and then creative understanding. Uh, where we say, uh, if I write a sentence on a chalkboard and students can follow it, then they have like a passive understanding of it. And if they can reproduce it in a meaningful way on an exam, then they have like an active understanding of it. And if they remember it like two years later in a different context and say, hey, I've learned something, I can apply it here, then they have creative understanding. I mean, this is uh, some of the usual terminology here. And then we can ask, okay, uh, we test our students, right? Uh, administering exams and stuff, can we put like Siri to an exam and see whether it's active, passive, or creative under understanding? Would that work? And then as you all now know, uh, we have not really put Siri to this kind of test, uh, but we have built machines uh, that beat us at chess. Uh, and then that was not really a question whether they understand the meaning of what they were doing because of the way that the code was written, right? It was just um, crunching vast amounts of numbers uh, without like an understanding or a strategy or something. They followed a fixed strategy. But now this has recently changed, as you know, where machines learn by themselves without being told what to do, right? And now they beat us even at Go, right? Uh, for a long time considered the most complex game on the planet and no one would ever beat us, maybe in 200 years from now. And now they do not only beat us, they beat us with the moves that are not recorded in the history of the game that any player, any human player has ever made these moves uh, before. So it's the game changing here. Are they all now straight A students and have actually acquired creative understanding, right? Not just uh, um, active understanding. So if we look at the most advanced, at the cutting edge research here, I mean, I'm not an expert. Um, I can just uh, read and try to uh, keep myself informed. So uh, I went to the uh, Facebook AI group in France uh, because the f Facebook uh, Facebook's research is out in the open. So they share these things, they publish these things, and it's not behind like corporate walls. And if you look at what their uh, most cutting edge technology is, is uh, that they can not only recognize objects now, like trees or dogs or desk, uh, desks or chairs, but that they can also recognize these objects when they're partially obstructed like a person behind another person, right? Or uh, a person behind a bicycle, right? These, these kind of things, where you do not have like the entire ball, but the ball is hidden by, by, by a desk or something behind an object. Now, if you ask any three-year-old, 
and give them a marker and say, can you trace out the ball? Every th three year old will happily do that and say that's a ball and that's a person and that's a bicycle. So what's the deal here? Again, we have this intuition that the, even a three year old knows what these things mean, right? And that because of, uh, it means things for this uh, child, they have no difficulty in tracing out the object. While even the most advanced uh, programs that we have right now, they are just uh, crunching vast amounts of numbers and all that they see are sequences of zeros and, and ones, but they do not have meaning. So then if this is what we really um, understand the question to be about, then the question is uh, not whether Siri understands what I say, but whether Siri really understands the meaning of what I say. So this is what I will um, uh, focus on, this meaning aspect. Now, when computers became a reality in the 1950s and 60s, people were quick to point out that uh, they all will have uh, obvious uh, limits that are non-negotiable because of a famous result in mathematics called Gödel's incompleteness theorems. So that's a guy, he was born in Austria. He studied uh, most of his time in Vienna, and then he fled the Nazis and came to America and spent the rest of his life at the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Princeton. So what was this um, thing about? Um, suppose, to understand what Gödel's result is about, suppose you write a computer program. And this computer program just lists everything that is true about the natural numbers. Nothing fancy, just natural numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You add them, you multiply them, you equate them. Right? No, nothing fancy. And then you just write a program that lists these things, right? So this is the beginning, right? And then the question is, can you write such a program, right, that I call a truth teller, right, because it only tells the truth about the natural numbers? Will such a truth teller, if you make it a little bit more advanced, right, and if you have run it forever, will it by and by list all the sentences that are true about the natural numbers. If you look at it, it looks like a fairly easy combinatorial task, right? You just need to interweave various of these lists, right? And then in the end, it's get complicated and more complicated and even more complicated. But in the end, right, uh, whenever there is a uh, sentence that is true about the natural numbers, it will be somewhere in this list. Like all the natural numbers, they go on without end, but if you have a natural number, it will eventually show here. Oh, I have a pointer. It will eventually show here, right? And the same then with, with the sentences. If you have a sentence, uh, if it's true or false, then it will eventually show in this list. So that's the idea. Seems easy as pie. Turns out it's not. Gödel proved, and that is his famous theorem, that any such truth teller, right, any such truth teller, will leave out sentences that we know to be true. Right? So a truth teller will know some of the truth, but never all of the truth. Now this is a quite, quite remarkable um, a result. It was remarkable for uh, two reasons. When Gödel proved it, it basically rocked the foundation of what we believe mathematics to be. We believe mathematics is built on solid, rigorous proof. Right? And in terms of proof, his result means there are certain things that you cannot prove using certain means. It, it is not as bad as people believed uh, when he first published his re result, but it's still pretty bad. Then when later his research, when further uh, research uh, combined this results with actually computability, it said there is a hard ceiling, a non-negotiable hard ceiling to computation something computing machines can never ever do, period. So this is quite uh, remarkable. And I believe it's remarkable enough uh, that we spent just a little bit of time uh, on how we proved it. Uh, that will be fairly, fairly quick. And this is also then a stepping stone for how this then relates to our main question, namely meaning. So 
Shall we go into the ball pit and play some balls here? OK, so suppose you are in this ball pit, and now you take out balls, right? And uh, I have a little animation here. So let us say uh, we have uh, these balls, and then we sort them, right? We uh, sort them into sequences of five, right? So everyone now picks out five. And now we all have like sequences of five, and now we want to compare them, right? Whether mine is prettier or yours better, right? So what we do is then we arrange them in like these square arrays, right? And now look uh, what we can do here. Now, oops. So suppose we have arranged our uh, sequences here this way, right? And now look at this diagonal sequence. If we had like a rows of five before, then this diagonal sequence is a row of five again. You see it? And what we have done here, we, we put this diagonal sequence here on top. So the red goes here, the black goes here, the black goes here. Well, provided I didn't make mistakes. The red goes up here, and then this one goes up here. OK? And now we can basically take this sequence here and move it down and see whether we can find it again among these rows here. So here we have it. Here we have the diagonal, right? And then we put it up here, right? And then we can compare it. Is it equal to, to, to this one? No, of course not, right? We have a mismatch here. Oh, we have a mismatch here again, a mismatch here. So this, oh no, this is totally hopeless, right? And then uh, what about the last one? Yes, we got lucky. Look at here. Look at here. Look at here. This is really a match. Now, the interesting thing is if, if you look at it, if you have the diagonal here, and if the diagonal is equal to, to one or more of, of these rows, then you have a ball that hasn't changed its, its color. You see this one? Right? It's black in this row, and it's a black ball in the di diagonal. So this has not changed its color. This will be important. It's what we will call a fixed point. So now we add a little bit here to the fun, because just playing with the balls is, can you? OK. I was distracted by the cursor here. So what we are doing now is, uh, this is, I believe, uh, the same array we had with the same rows of balls. We have the same diagonal here. You see it's up here, red and black and black and red and black. And now we change colors. Now we change red into black and black into, into red. OK? So this now should become black. This one should become red and so on and so forth. Let us see. Right here we see the uh, tr uh, transition. And then we are done. And now what you can see is this was the first ball, right? That was red, now it's black. So that means this transformed diagonal, that was the original diagonal, now it's transformed. It cannot be identical to the first row because they share the same ball and it just changes its color. This cannot be identical to, to the second one because it just changed its color. Cannot be identical to the third because we just changed its color and so on and so forth for all the rows, right? So we have transformed diagonal, and now it's no longer in our array, although it was previously in the array. This is also important. This is what we call we have diagonalized out, right? We have transformed the diagonal, and now it's no longer in the array. Now, last round of playing balls. Now we uh, change colors. Remember, we had, we had blue, blue ones as well. Now we do the same with like blue. We have a different array, right? Then we look at the diagonal here. We look at the diagonal. We, we put it up here. And now we change colors again. Don't blame the machine, it's me. So now we change colors again, but now we have three colors. Uh, we leave red. Red, we do not touch it, but black changes into blue, and blue changes into black. 
So red remains the same. This will go black. This will go blue. This will stay red. And this will uh, turn black. So, uh, yeah, 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 I'm so bad at these things. So this is what we get, right? You see the uh, transformation here. Now we have the new. And now we can compare it again. So is this a match? Oh, no, this one is not. Is this a match? Oh, no, this is not a match. And this is not a match either, right? But look here. Bingo. Red, red, black, black, blue, blue, red, red, black, black. Bingo. The transform diagonal is again identical to, to one of the rows. And what we have again is, look here, a fixed point, something that remains. This is a red ball in this row, and it was a red ball in this diagonal, right? So what does it mean? We have basically, if we play around with these balls and then transform uh, sequences, and especially diagonals, we have basically two cases that can happen. Either uh, the diagonal is not any of these rows, and we have diagonalized out, or the diagonal, the transform diagonal, happens to be identical to one of the rows, but then we have a fixed point, a ball that has not changed color or uh, position. Now you say, this is silly. Why are we playing balls? Well, it's not silly. This is the essence of fundamental results in mathematics. Uh, Georg Cantor, uh, the founder of set theory, used uh, this diagonal argument to prove that there are orders of infinity and that they are like as many as natural numbers, then as many as real numbers, and so on and so forth. And this forms an infinite hierarchy of infinite. So this is, yes, it is playing ball, but it has really deep mathematical uh, significance. Now, the thing about fixed points, this came much later. And this is one of the ingredients that Gödel used uh, to prove his famous incompleteness theorem, fixed points. Uh, at that time, he was not, not aware that he was using fixed points, but now we know that was uh, what like, was under the hood, right? So what else uh, do we need to understand uh, Gödel's uh, theorem and uh, the proof? And this is uh, what we will call representation. So uh, suppose you are, I have some notes, and I should look at them at least occasionally, so that I'm not uh, completely lost here. Um, suppose, when you were doing this like presentation here, or you are, uh, you're working on, on a Word document, right? And you're typing in and you look at the screen, right? So uh, when you type in something, and you type in a, an A or a T, you do not send an A or a T into the machine, right? And when you look at the screen and, and you see a text or you see graphics, uh, there is not the graphics in the machine or something. So it gets translated. And as you know, it uh, gets translated into what we call like binary numbers, right? Oh, yes, I mentioned, I, I forgot something. That's why. <laughs> Remember the argument about diagonalization and fixed points? And this, has, I mean, seems like silly play stuff, but it's really deep, deep mathematics. So if you like that, and, and if you say this is cool, you should declare a major in mathematics. <laughs> or a second, right? OK, so now. So this is how we do it, right? So we have like a, a capital letter A, right? Then it gets translated into a, a, the 65. And then 65 gets translated into 1, 1, 0, 2s, uh, whatever, 0, 4s, 0, uh, where am I at? 8, 16, and 164, right? And the letter T then accordingly. So these are these like binary numbers. Now, when you keep on writing, then maybe you have a typo, right? And you fix it, or you delete a sentence, or you move an entire paragraph or something, right? So what is it? What does it translates into is that the machine has everything represented in these like binary numbers, and then it's crunching these numbers, adding them, multiplying them, dividing them, comparing them. And so everything then that you do when you type in the keyboard and when you see changes on, on the screen is internally represented to like this sort of number crunching. So this is 
Uh, what we can see here, if you see an A, say, on the screen or something, then some number crunching uh, yielded this, digi oh, this digital, oh, it's probably wrong. Yes, copy and paste error, right? So you, some are crunching uh, yielded uh, this number. Now, if we generalize it and go away from like word uh, processing, what we have then is uh, something like, if you see anything, then what you have that there is some binary code, hash x. So if you see some x, then there is some binary code, hash x, uh, that uh, represents inside uh, the system. So what we have then is sort of this like general, general uh, thing here, where this funny word means if and only if. So if you have something in the real world, then you have a hash x in your computer. And if you have this hash x in the computer, well, this represents this capital X in uh, the real world. So the R is for uh, representation. So this is all familiar because we have been using these things, uh, some of us, since childhood. I mean, some had their cell phone in the cradle, uh, some are still uh, whatever, have a longer history. Um, <clears throat> But uh, when Gödel proved his uh, result, he basically sort of anticipated all this and said, okay, uh, if this is true, if this representation uh, holds, and he proved that it holds, then we can not just uh, do like word, word processing, but then we can actually construct a real world sentence that says something about a truth teller namely that the truth teller will output something. So T does or does not output something, whatever it is, some X. And this then is true if and only if some hash G, right, is processed internally. So this is where he used the representation. So to have this, such a sentence that T does not output something that is true in the real world, then it gets translated into this hash G, right, inside the computer. And then he applied the fixed point uh, to get uh, this silly sentence that uh, says T does not output hash G if and only if hash G has G. You see, this is uh, uh, the fixed point where it remains the same, right? Where you insert a sentence into a sentence, but it uh, remains uh, the same. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's. So, and then what you can then show is that based on these fixed point properties, this sentence if, can never be in the output of this truth teller. So this is a sentence that this truth teller will never output because of the properties of this fixed point. So this is how he proved his famous um, result. So does it mean uh, we are done already and co can go home? Well, there was this argument being made that because the truth teller cannot output this sentence, and because the truth teller cannot output its sentence, it just proves that the sentence must be true. But we know, I mean, we just look at the proof and say, obviously it's true, so we outperform any truth teller. Therefore, they are dumb machines, we are the smart, smart humans. So this was uh, an argument that was made for 30, 40 years almost uh, in, many, many variations, but no matter how you try to defend it, it fails. Uh, you cannot really, I mean, it's very intuitive uh, because it seems to align very well with our intuitions about what we are and, and what machines are, but if you really make it precise, it's a bad argument. And it does not speak about meaning, by the way, right? So where does meaning come in? Meaning comes in with a uh, second result that is closely related to uh, the first one. So now we do not start out with, with a sentence uh, that um, talks about outputting something. Now we say something about flat lies. So what is uh, the thing about flat lies? We build machines so that they won't malfunction. We do not want a computer to, to crash. We do not want a computer to freeze. We do not want a computer to lose hours of our work, right? When it comes to a truth teller, what does it mean is uh, that we do not want to tell us lies, right? It should not output things like zero equals one. 
I mean, these are different numbers. Come on, computer, right? Zero is zero, and one is one, and zero is never one. So we do not want a truth teller to include these things. Now suppose that a truth teller never tells a lie. Right? Then we call him a consistent truth teller. Right? And so what this, oops, what this then um, uh, re reflects here if t does not output a flat lie, something like 0 equals 1, then this is sort of a consistent truth teller, right? So this is true if and only if t is a consistent truth teller. And then we know by representation that there is something number crunching, this hash uh, thing that uh, is the equivalent in the matrix world of the computer. And then what follows actually, uh, what Gödel could show is that uh, that's the second incompletion theorem that no consistent truth teller will ever output uh, that it's uh, consistent, right? That it's a consistent truth teller. So how does it now uh, has to do with the meaning? Now suppose you are not on Earth, suppose you are on Mars, and you meet, first time you meet Martians, and you're an electrical engineer, so you talk shop, right? And then you realize that Martians are much more cautious programmers than we are, right? What we do is basically, if a result is X, then output it, right? Get it out. Martians are much more, more careful. Martians say, okay, I have an output, uh, I have a result that is X, but before I output it, I first verify and double check whether x is some nonsensical garbage, like 0 equals 1. And only if it's not garbage, then I will output it. So this is then how a Martian compute, uh, computation looks like. This is what we do, and the Martians, as I said, they are much more cautious, right? Now suppose um, we adopt the Martian uh, uh, approach, and then um, adopt this as our computing paradigm here, right? And then we can say if something follows this recipe of the Martians, then it does not output things, it M outputs things, like does it the Martian way, M outputs, right? And then we have a Martian consistency statement, T does not M output a flat lie. And then surprise, surprise, the Martians can prove that their truth tellers are consistent and the Martian truth tellers output that they are consistent. So we have a contradiction here. The original theorem says no consistent truth teller does ever output it and now we have a consistent truth teller, M outputs it. Oh, M outputs, M is missing here, right? M outputs it. So what is, what is going on here? Uh, most people will uh, say, uh, that what is at stake here is that Martians do not really understand what consistency is. And so this is why there is no real conflict. They do not understand the meaning of consistency. That's why. If they would know the true meaning of consistency, then they would get this result, right? So what we have here is then the question, does a truth teller, whether it's a terrestrial truth teller or a Martian truth teller, do these truth tellers really grasp the meaning of what they output? So this is at stake here, right? And then we see this has a striking similarity to uh, the question that we are addressing today. Does Siri grasp the meaning of what it says? So this is the, uh, the uh, connection here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, what do people say? Uh, what constitutes the meaning of uh, anything? So the first rigorous uh, theory of meaning was developed by Alfred Tarski in the 1930s. Uh, he was born in uh, Poland. He was a member of the Love Warsaw School. It was a famous school where philosophers and mathematicians cooperated very actively uh, until uh, the Nazis drove them all out. And so he had a lot of exposure. Uh, he heard lectures. Uh, about Aristotle, and Aristotle had a famous theory of truth, and it's uh, very easy to say of what is, that it is, and to say of what is not, that it's not, right? So if you say it rains, and it rains, you're telling uh, the truth, right? And if you say it does not rain, and it, and it does not happen to rain, then you're still te telling uh, the truth. So this does not seem to be very, very, um, 
advancing our uh, understanding much. And uh, the way that uh, Tarski phrased it is, a snow is white even only if snow is white. So the sentence snow is white is uh, true even only if snow is white. So why is this uh, progress here? Well, Tarski added so something else. Tarski added something else that really made it work, and that is uh, what we call a uh, recursion. Uh, we all know recursion. If we look at tally numbers, right? Uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, draw a stroke and call it a one, and then we draw two strokes, call it a two, right? And we, talk, and we call any number of, uh, we draw any number of strokes, and then the number of strokes represents uh, the number. So this is uh, what we all know, tallies. And then we can um, say, okay, wh what are we doing there? And then we can, uh, whatever, capture this in two rules and say, uh, tally number, uh, tally rule one is, if you have nothing, you may draw a stroke. If you have drawn something already, you may add one. So if you have two, you may add one to get three, right? And then you can use it into what we call a rules-based production. Uh, you draw a, a single stroke, your permission is given by T1, you add one by T2, you add one by T2, and so on and so forth, right? Recursion. Now we can use this. Uh, let me let me go back here. One. Um, now we, uh, most scholars agree that language that we speak is also rule based, right? And that these rules are actually reflect this recursive structure. So what we can do is we can try to find rules, for example, that capture the grammar of a language, and find rules that capture the meaning of, of a language, and give it this. Uh, this a framework. So uh, let's look at a toy example here. We have three grammar rules here. The first grammar rule allows me to write down any name, like a single stroke, right? Write down any name. You may write down any, any predicate, right? Like green or runs or Tom or, or waiting or whatever. Activity like running, waiting, flying, reading, right? Uh, or like being green, color, happy, whatever. And then if you combine a name and a predicate, if you have them, you may combine them and then you get a sentence. So I may write uh, a name, I may write some predicate, and then I may uh, combine them. So this is our, our grammar, right? Now there's no meaning so far. So what we add now are meaning rules that piggyback on the grammar rules. So then I have a rule for names and say a name n denotes an individual, a predicate denotes a property, and when I have a name and a predicate combined into a sentence that makes a statement, then this, uh, it's true or false, right? And then what I get then is basically a rules-based meaning production. M means Mary, S blank means blank is smart, and what I get is Mary is smart is true, right? And this actually works. I mean, believe it or not, this really works, <laughs> right? And it works like a charm for the entire language of mathematics. It works like a charm for all artificial languages that we have, like computer languages, right? Tarski's student in LA, uh, Richard Montague, uh, moved it over to like natural languages. Then we uh, call it uh, Montague semantics and no longer Tarski semantics. Montague semantics, and it's the pet theory of most uh, theoretical linguists because it even seems to work for natural languages, right? I mean, the rules get more complex, but it works. So, yes, celebrate again. Why? Because now you know what recursion is. Now you can declare a major in computer science or in linguistics or still be in mathematics, right? Okay, so how does it really solve uh, things here? What this results in is that this actually comes, comes out, right? Snow is white is true. This sentence is true even only if snow is white. So in the end, if you apply Tarski semantics or uh, Montague semantics, this really falls out, right? And then it's no longer trivial. It's really the result of a computation, right? Now, if you, if you look at this, this has a striking similarity here, right? So we have something in the real world, and then we have something in a natural or in an artificial language, right? You see the similarity, right? 
you have a sense in the natural language here, you have some expression in the computer language here, and they both are true if and only if something is true in uh, the real world. Now, if this really is a criterion, right? If really the meaning of a sentence is its truth conditions, that's the usual phrase, right? The meaning of a sentence is in its truth conditions, right? Then we have solved our, our problem. Because we had this earlier, right? That the Martian computer, the Martian truth teller, right? Outputs this, and then this is, um, and then because this is the case if uh, the truth teller is a consistent tr truth teller, then we have solved it. The Martian truth teller does understand the meaning, right? It follows the same pattern here, right? Then we have to say, yes, the Martian truth teller know, knows what it's talking about. So are we done yet? And I mean, I see um, scientists here. I mean, scientists, they use this, right? They use this because this is why we trust simulations, right? Uh, we run a computer simulation here, say about global warming, and then believe it has effects here, right? So we are, we are applying this. Now, if we do not plug in uh, the, um, the Martian truth teller here, some computer machine, but some other artifact, does it still sound very convincing? What about a thermometer, right? Follows the same uh, pattern. Something is true in the real world, and this artifact here, right, uh, represents it accurately, right? If the temperature changes here, it states, it changes it internal states, right? So is this an internal state equally good as this, right? We can move on to biology, right? Chemotaxis. Paramecial moves if ambient whatever acidity or something rises or lessens, right? So does it mean if we grant a Martian truth teller or a computer uh, actually meaning, right? Does it mean the thermometer understands the, the meaning of temperature? Does it mean a para uh, paramecium or any protozoan, right, understands the meaning of what acidity is, right? You have to decide, right? We cannot go and turn rocks and say, what is the definition of meaning, right? It's what we as people have to uh, find out. Um, I would say no. I would say no, right? I would say no. But I believe this is actually not, this is actually not a yes, no question. I believe it's a matter of degrees. Why? In the end, we need to tell a story how we as humans grasp meaning. I mean, we, we believe we do. Maybe we don't, but we believe we do. And then evolutionary speaking, this ability that we can grasp meaning must come somewhere. And if it's true that evolution never throws things away but always adds on top, right? then maybe this is not a conceptual response that reflects meaning, but it's still an adequate behavioral response. And maybe this is the deepest layer of meaning, that we as organisms are able to have an adequate behavioral response. And then later evolution adds to it and gives it, advances it to a more like conceptual um, response. At least this is how I would read it. So, but can we add, can we say mo more to it? Yes. And I wish to continue this evolutionary story. So, as I said, this is my, my conclusion. Uh, your mileage may differ. So, if we talk to people in an anthropology, what we are as human beings, then they will tell us that we are social primates, like chimps or bonogos, right? Uh, but that we are special for two reasons. One is somewhat unremarkable that we walk upright on two feet, right? The other one, however, is very re remarkable, and that is our language. No other social primate has uh, this, like, complex language that we have. And the language that we have is actually deeply social, so it really reinforces the message that we are social primates. Why? Because you cannot learn a language alone, but if you are in a group of peers, you will learn it no matter what, right? I mean, we have these spectacular stories about Creole languages, 
uh, or other um, uh, situations where children were not taught a language, but they created their own language because there was a biological need at that time for them to develop this language. So it's deeply, deeply social. Now, if language is a social practice, like grooming is, right? Um, then uh, let's look at what we do uh, with the language. So it comprises a lot of social uh, practices, like reporting things, exchanging information, apologizing, uh, wishing well, right? But there's also one practice that stands out from the side of philosophy, and that is the social practice of asking and give, asking for and giving reasons. So, for example, uh, why were you late? What were the reasons that you were late? How does it work? What do you believe are the mechanical reasons for this con con contraption to function? And so on and so forth. So if you think about it, it's really deeply embedded into our daily social practice that we always ask for and then provide and, and give reasons. And this is the definition that Wilfred Sellers gave of what rationality is. He said an agent A is rational if and only if or to the degree that this agent can participate in the social practice of giving and asking for reasons. So what does it have to do uh, with, with the meaning? Uh, if we engage in this, in this practice, what we need at our dis disposal is what are called semantic nets. So uh, you have a word uh, like bird, and then you look at uh, what you associate with like bird, like wings and feathers and animals and insects and what and whatnot, right? And then you get this, what is called sort of this like semantic net, right? Uh, where everything is related to, to everything else. And these semantics nets are part of the information that we use if we engage in the social practice of asking and giving for, for, for reasons, right? Because uh, this is what allows us uh, to say, uh, yeah, to, to, to like play this game, right? And so you can think of uh, uh, whatever the meaning then the word has is uh, it's like a net, right? The spider sits in the middle of the net, right? And the net is uh, the meaning. And the idea is that we use these um, uh, semantic nets. And then we arrive at a different uh, conception of uh, what meaning is then meaning, to understand the meaning of a sentence, uh, means to understand what else it logically entails so that you know what the commitments are that you make if you have uttered it, but that you also know what else would imply the sentence, right? So that you can really navigate these networks of interwoven semantic nets and that you know if you are in a particular spot from where you can get there, right? And from where you can, you can leave again, right? And we can model these things with like algebra and graph theory and logic and probability theory. And this really um, gives us quite sophisticated model of, of meaning again. And then the question is, is this a better understanding of what meaning is? to be able to play the social game, right, of knowing what is entailed and what entails what? I believe yes. I believe it's good enough for uh, Gödel's second theorem. So if uh, we basically look at the output of a truth teller, right, and look at everything the truth teller says about consistency, right, and if all this would at least in theory, right, empower the truth teller to have a conversation with us, then I would be happy to grant him an understanding of the meaning, right? the grasping. When it comes to theory, I don't know. right? If you see a compelling story told as an ex machina, right, where the lady robot right, plays this game perfectly, I do no longer have a reason at least to, to object. Right? But again, maybe your mileage uh, may vary. But I would like to add something to it. <clears throat> and this has to do with what, um, at least up until till recently, was uh, a dominating paradigm in computer science, 
uh, in parts of psychology, uh, but also in philosophy of mind. And this has to do with the long-standing tradition that we conceive of the mind as somehow separated from the body, what we call like dualism, right? And so for centuries, no, for millennia, right? Uh, what thinking and grasping meaning, uh, that was a faculty of a soul or of divine spark. And if we would separate the two, maybe the soul was, would lose access to like perception, but it would still be thinking, right, and reasoning. It would not lose this uh, ability. And I mean, it's so deeply embedded, not, in, not just in our culture, in other cultures, right? I mean, there are ghosts who stick around, right? Uh, maybe uh, there's transmigration of souls, right, that you get reincarnated over and over again. Now, this is so deeply embedded that uh, the most dominating approach uh, was what we call functionalism. And functionalism in a philosophy of mind and cognitive psychology is the idea, if you really water it down, is that the mind that we believe we have is just a computer program that does not run on hardware, it runs on wetware, right? It runs on a wet, messy brain. But other than that, it's just a program, right? And if you watch Netflix, uh, that was just put into uh, a new series, Altered Carbon, right? Souls are stacks and bodies are sleeves, and you can freely uh, swap them in and out, right? So if the, is this, uh, well, the question is, is this true? So this is why I would like to turn to, to Dilti uh, towards the end. And he was against dualism, or if you want to, he was against Altered Carbon. Uh, why? Uh, this is one of um, uh, uh, a quote. I explain the belief in the external world not as the result of, so the question is, are we living in a, in a matrix world, yes or no? Is there a real world out there, right? Or is it just the product of our uh, imagination? So, and previously this was people tried to reason their way to the existence of an external world. And he said, ah, I don't believe this. I explain the belief in the external world not as the result of reasoning processes, but of a context of life that is constituted by appetite, volition and sentiment, and mediated by processes that are somehow similar to reasoning. And this brutish human existence, together with social and in intellectual sentiments and volitions, form the human willpower that reaches out its tentacles all over, seeking gratification and satisfaction. Uh, almost like Shakespeare, uh, to me at least. Okay, so look at this, right? Uh, he talks about the brutish human existence and says, well, it has processes that are mediated similar to, to reasoning, right? So, what we have separated, right, he really puts back into our, into the flesh, so to speak, right? And he was, there, there's more to it, so, but he was uh, uh, among the first. Now, what I would uh, talk uh, the remaining uh, time would be what is called embodied cognition, which can mean a lot of things in different contexts. Uh, Sometimes, oh no, okay, don't be critical here. Um, what I'm interested in is, embodied meaning. The claim that in order to grasp the full meaning of language, one needs to have the experience of a body, right? Now this made you strike odd, but I will try to convince you at least initially by using examples from an area that where you do not expect it, namely from mathematics. So go back to elementary school. I hope, I hope, or we all hope, that uh, you used your fingers when you were counting, or like your legs or something. Because we have empirical evidence, if students are prohibited, if they are told not to, they will suffer. They lack in number comprehension later. So you knew uh, you need to do this. Uh, before we left Germany, there was a uh, report on the German NPR there was a fancy new, new uh, neighborhood. They were built completely new. It was so advanced, they did away with all stairs. Then an associated a neighborhood school, an elementary school, and all the kids just sucked at arithmetic. They could not count. They, they simply couldn't. And they were totally in the dark. 
And then they had an outlandish suspicion. They included stair walking to the curriculum. And all of a sudden, performance went up. <sighs> Think of uh, easy uh, examples. Two is whatever, smaller than three, and five is bigger than, than two. How do you know what small and big means? Right? Think of the number line. And you're told that, that uh, numbers fall into a certain order, like left and right and in, in a, a between. How do you know what these words mean? Suppose you are like uh, in college, right? And you learn like a, a tangent touches a curve in, in a single point. What, what does it mean to touch? Right? Or a limit approaches. What does it mean to, to approach? There are a number of really convincing studies, I think convincing studies, that in order to understand these, these words, right, we actually go back to our body experience and then use some sort of metaphorical usage to understand these things. So we know what it means for numbers to be bigger or taller because we all had like older siblings or parents that were taller or we were taller, right? And we all know what it means to be in between and left and right because we have an orientation in space, right? And all these things. And so the idea then is that we cannot reach like the lofty uh, levels of ab abstraction in mathematics without basically building up the meaning one metaphorical step at a time. There's something else uh, that uh, fits into this context. Uh, see how we talk in life, right? She doesn't know what it means to, to be poor. She was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. He doesn't know what it means to be pregnant, and he never will, right? Uh, they don't know what it means to really serve. They are draft archers, right? I mean, there are certain intuitions, and in order to fully grasp the meaning, you have to be in their shoes, to be in a specific situation yourself. There's a famous thought experiment. Uh, it's called Mary. Mary is a super-duper scientist. She's a specialist in color vision. She knows everything there is about color vision. She knows all the physics, all the frequencies and electromagnetism and Maxwell equations, everything. She knows all the mathematics, all the neuroscience, all the psychology. She knows it all, right? There's a snack, however, to her life. She was raised in a black and white environment. And then she's released out in the wild. Grass green, right? Red tomatoes, blue sky. Obviously, that's our intuition, right? She has learned something new. But what did she learn? By assumption, everything that we have talked about earlier, the semantic net, the truth conditions, that was all textbook knowledge. She, she knew it all, right? So what was added, right? The moment that she first saw colors. So this is the same intuition, that there's a different kind of knowledge, what we may call to know how. To know how it feels to see a color. Maybe to know how it feels to be terrified by the idea that your husband comes home drunk and beats you, right? Maybe to feel panic because you know that the next panic attack is coming, right? So there is a different kind of knowledge, this knowledge how it feels, right? And maybe, maybe this is what we want to add to our definition of what meaning is, right? I believe this is one of the reasons why we love the arts and why we love to, to read novels. Right? So one of my favorite stories about Confucius, this Chinese sage is, at least according to legend, he attended a concert once and he lost his appetite for three months. Right? Losing your appetite for three months because of one spectacular musical performance. I believe it has not added anything to his semantic nets, right? But it added to his, his ability to know something, how it, how it feels. Okay, so, obviously this does not apply to uh, Gödel's second theorem. It's a little bit uh, too much, I believe. But when it comes to um, Siri or Ex Machina, Probably this is what we want to add. Okay, so wrapping things up. We have looked at three proposals. 
we have looked at uh, three proposals here. To know the meaning of a sentence is, according to Tarski, to know its truth conditions. And we said, at least I su uh, su suggested, it's not sufficient for, uh, to answer uh, the question either for uh, Gödel or for Siri. Then we said, according to Sellers, it's the ability to give and ask for the relevant reasons, right, that are connected to uh, the meaning. And I said, this is good enough for me uh, when it comes to uh, Gödel, uh, but for Siri, it's up to you. And then we looked at, um, according to Dilte, that it requires the know-how of a living organism, that you know how it feels, right, to be a body and to suffer through whatever it is to have a body. And then again, I believe it's uh, a little bit um, too much for uh, Gödel, but I don't know where we uh, should decide here. This is what I would compare, I mean, um, like 30, 40 years back, uh, when the medical sciences made advances so that they could transplant sensitive tissue, like a heart and not just retinas. They needed to harvest these organs uh, fresh. So they needed a new definition of what it means for a person to be legally dead. And Harvard Medical School proposed one, you're legally dead if your brain has ceased to function, right? Most societies have adopted it because it has its obvious benefits, right? Um, it is informed by facts, right? I mean, you need to know how the brain works and all this, so it's informed by facts. But it's not enforced by the facts. We, as a society, we need to decide what is an appropriate definition that we want to put in place. And there were some cultures, like the Japanese, who actually resisted it. They said, no, we don't like it, right? For at least 20, 30 years. And I believe we are in a similar shoes here. If we want to say whether Siri, right? actually understands the meaning of, of something, then I believe this is a question that should be informed by facts and best theories, but in the end it's up to us where we uh, put the, uh, the bar here or here or in between or lower or even higher. Right? It's up to us. But I believe we need to do these things because it has ramifications. Suppose uh, I ask Siri frantically to call the numbers of all my, my friends right? And then a day later, I'm dead because I committed suicide. If Siri understood what I was doing, then whom, whom do my parents sue, right? So the moment that we attribute meaning to our artifacts, that they really grasp something, it has legal and it has moral uh, ramifications, right? And this is why, according to some news outlets at least, Silicon Valley hires more people with a non-engineering degree recently, right, uh, than before because they need to delve and dive into these uh, complicated uh, questions. Now, I believe um, it should not be a matter of either or, you're an engineer or you're humanities. I believe we need both, right? We need people who write code and read Confucius. And I hope that the... Uh, curriculum of Purdue Fort Wayne will provide such an education to its students. Thank you.